All right. Joseph Prince. Genuine grace is not a license to sin. Well, I don't like that verb. It doesn't say that in the Bible. But it certainly says if you're saved by grace, you've been freed from the absolute dominion of sin. However, doesn't mean that you uh, can't choose to sin again. So in the moment that you choose to sin again, you know any Christians that are perfect? They could choose to sin again. That moment, you reinstitute your enslavement to sin. It'll be for a moment or for how long you decide to sin. Isn't that sin covered? Well, here we go. By the way, believers do not have the power in this temporal life to live above the dominion of sin. So where are you getting this? In another religious book? Not in the Bible. The believer is given through the Holy Spirit the power to live above the dominion of sin. Well, if we no longer have the dominion of sin, we've been freed from it. So that doesn't make sense. So, I have to reword this. By the way, believers do not have the power in this temporal life to live above the dominion of sin because once you have become a believer, they are not under the dominion of sin. It's an identity. It says so. However, believers can choose to read I'm quoting out of Romans. Slave themselves to sin. I.e. Live voluntarily put themselves under the dominion of sin once again. But they have been given the power to not do that. Yet, there will be no moments of sinless perfection in this temporal life for any believer. This is the problem with cherry-picking verses and ignoring the context and not going through a passage verse by verse. The believer at the point of salvation is no longer under the absolute dominion of sin until he decides to re-enslave himself to that dominion once again and again and again. And that's how God's grace unto eternal life operates. Check out Romans 6, 1 from the beginning throughout the chapter. The believer put this and close this. The believer keeps his salvation forever because all of his sins are covered by Christ's propitiation for him past, present, and future to that eternal life end, no matter what. So for those moments after he got saved and freed from the absolute dominion of sin in which he continues to sin, those sins are nevertheless covered. 
despite the fact that that believer has re enslaved himself once again to sin. And he may choose to continue in sin thereafter. However, it suits him to ignore his job as a Christian and not study to show himself approved and follow the leading of the Holy Spirit within him to obey what he has learned. But instead follow the prompting temptations of the sin nature within him regard, disregarding the circumstances and the consequences if he does. For there are disciplinary consequences if the believer continues in sin. Take a look at that and file a discipline from not living out the length of his years appointed to him, die physically early, to the loss of eternal rewards which will enhance one's eternity beyond imagination as believers will have the inestimable capacity to serve God in unimaginably satisfying, joyful ways, lost if they do not persevere in the faith. Be lost. What an inestimable and sorrowful loss that will be to the extent of weeping and gnashing the teeth for the believer during the millennial rule as he continues to reside in the millennial kingdom. Thereafter, all tears will be wiped away. Matthew chapter 22. I gave this sermon. They came to the pastor and wanted me kicked out of the church for preaching it. And actually, the pastor worked with me on this sermon. <clears throat> and so he kicked him out of his house and says, leave him alone. He's doing a good job. Now nobody would talk to me, so I was kind of got banished by that church. Although the pastor and I established a relationship when I moved to Florida. He was such a, a, a mentor for me. It was really terrific. In any case, <clears throat> Matthew 22. Take a look at that study. <clears throat> also, Joseph Prince says, there will, be, will always be a small number of people who are abusing grace, stirring controversy with counterfeit grace teachings, and living in ways that do not glorify the Lord. But what should our response be? Should we shy away from preaching and teaching the true grace of God because of the controversies and abuses? Certainly not. I exhort you today with the words of Titus to speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. Well, amen, Pastor Pence, with a proviso. The grace of God which forgives the sins the believer continues in is not a counterfeit grace. Actually, these words do not appear together in anywhere in Scripture, nor are they explained. It is real, after all, Christ, it is real, after all, Christ died for those sins. So, I would say, so, grace is real. After all, Christ died for the sins, and it is applicable to all believers. Regardless of their behavior. They are bought, those sins, are bought and paid for, and the individual who believes in Christ's payment is forgiven of all sins, past, present, and future, unto eternal life. 
But the value of his life, I say his, the believer's life, if he is largely unfaithful, will be of little value, thereby the second kind of salvation, the preservation of his temporal life for eternal rewards in heaven, will be little, if not nothing. What a shame, though, that the believer who continues in sin and takes advantage of God's grace, and thereby does not move into being more faithful instead, he will pay in his life, and the next, when he suffers great loss of rewards in eternity, and great discipline while he remains in his mortal body. His residence in heaven is a free gift, but his lifestyle will cause him to suffer great loss when he realizes for the rest of eternity that the joy he will have is severely severely limited because he did not persevere in the faith in his temporal life. Now, Pastor Prince, that is the new true grace of God. There is nothing counterfeit in his forgiving believers who continue in sin. Christ paid for those sins, all of them even those the believer commits in his Christian life. How grand is it, is that? How sad if the believer does not move on in the Christian life. So that is why you are right in exhorting others with the words of Titus to speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority, that no one dis uh, despise you. For doing this to the end that God's grace will not have to be exercised in covering so many sins for the believer who has decided to continue in sin and not move on in the Christian faith, as Paul so aptly preaches, especially in Romans 6, 1, FF, from beginning to end. And, moving on, Joseph Prince goes on to say, let's move this up a little bit, in other words, don't back away from preaching the grace of God. Amen. In fact, we should be doubling down on our preaching of the God, genuine gospel, that teaches to all, all to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and to live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. The more genuine grace is preached, the more counterfeit grace teachings will be stamped out. Again, if you would stop using the phrases genuine gospel and genuine grace, you would be biblical. These phrases do not appear or are explained in God's words as such. So long as you go verse by verse in your teaching, for example, Romans 6, 1, from beginning to end, you will be on target. You don't make up words and then define them in your own way. If they're not defined in the Bible, find something to that approximate what you think uh, the Bible is talking about, but follow the words of God's words properly read. There is only one gospel and one grace that describes God's operation, which is characterized by unmerited favor toward others relative to salvation unto eternal life. There are no counterfeit grace teachings addressed in God's word that are either gracious or they they are either gracious or they are not. Grace means unmerited favor and can apply to how God operates. So if God has saved you by grace and you go ahead and sin, that grace isn't counterfeit. That grace is real. Just that you've decided not to violate it because God gives you the latitude to choose to be Faithful or not. Just observe and report how God operates verse by verse by verse. God does forgive all of the wrongdoing of believers throughout their mortal lives no matter what. Read Romans 6, 1, beginning to end. There is a latitude by which believers can choose to sin, but there are consequences. Stop confusing people with your editorializations of the Bible by adding such phrases as genuine gospel and genuine grace when there is only one gospel and one grace and the Bible does not address genuine grace and genuine gospel and explain what is